Good afternoon, everybody from Astronomy Now, or should I say good evening for all those viewers in the United Kingdom. This is a live transmission, and we are hopefully going to be able to see one of the most spectacular photographs uh, that anybody's ever seen of whatever we are going to see, because at the moment, nobody has had the privilege to see any of the fine images that the Hubble Space Telescope, the, sorry, that the James Webb Space Telescope is capable of collecting and gathering that type of data. Up till now, of course, scientists have used telescopes at the tops of mountains, which they still do, uh, but they've also launched very sophisticated telescopes into space, not only ones that can capture visible images, the types that we can see with our own eyes, but of course, telescopes reveal it in far greater detail. Putting telescopes at the tops of mountains is useful. It's also less expensive than trying to put into space a large piece of technology and keeping your fingers crossed that it works. Well, something like the James Webb Space Telescope is incredibly complicated, and it is by far the largest telescope ever placed into space. Into space because it's away from the Earth. In fact, it's about one and a half million kilometers away from the Earth. And of course, when it was launched back in December, in fact, Christmas Day, uh, using an Ariane rocket to carry it aloft into its environment, it then took a, a very long journey slowing down all the time because it needed to arrive at its particular destination in space, uh, a place we call a Lagrange point, and there are uh, a number of Lagrange points around the Earth. Uh, in fact, uh, bodies such as planets and moons have points where there is neutral gravity, and that's where they've placed this wonderful piece of technology. Children, I think, are very keen to see astronauts floating around in space, and they imagine that's where there's no gravity, but in fact, there's plenty of gravity in space. There's gravity everywhere in space, in fact. But the further you are away from a, a large mass, such as a planet or a moon, of course, the gravity gets less. Nevertheless, there is a, a tug of war uh, between uh, planets and moons, and you can place objects at a st strategic position where this gravity cancels out, and that's exactly where the James Webb Space Telescope resides. Here we see an animation, or rather a, a real set of images video captured uh, back on Christmas Day uh, when the uh, James Webb Space Telescope was launched on an Ariane rocket from French Guiana, and it took the spacecraft in its lovely little environment at the top of the rocket, where everything is protected uh, under, under a fairing which protects it from racing through the Earth's atmosphere. But once it's above the atmosphere, they, they get rid, they eject the fairing. And here we see the James Webb Space Telescope moving away from the upper stage of the rocket. You can see the connection point, that ring there, which connects it to the upper stage. At the lower left part of the spacecraft, you can see the as yet unfurled solar panel. It had to open without the power nothing else would take place. There were so many bits to this spacecraft that had to not only do their job, but do it in the right order. And now I think you'll see the solar panel uh, opening up and they caught images of this. And I think several scientists were quite surprised they were going to get this, this image in the first place. To the upper right of the image, you can see uh, the Sinai Peninsula, Africa, and of course, uh, the deserts there as well. Uh, the Earth really is a globe, by the way, it isn't flat. Um, and uh, there goes the James Webb Space Telescope. There would be a long journey, uh, not only from the point of view of opening all the various bits, the solar panels, the big sun shield, the mirror itself had to be opened and then fully calibrated, shifting the mirrors and the segments very slightly. So eventually this composite eye made up of 18 smaller mirrors, each one really quite large in fact, uh, would eventually all knit together to form a single perfectly working homogeneous surface. It was very important that this should take place. It's not a question of just getting all the light from all those individual parts of the mirrors to focus to one point. It was actually making them seem as if all the light was coming off a single surface. Here we see the sun shield protecting 
the very delicate instruments that had to be cooled incredibly cold for them to work uh, efficiently. And uh, some of the instruments took months to cool down to the right um, sort of working uh, temperature. There were lots and lots of components. Here we see the two outer wings of the main mirror, 6.5 meters across, it's really quite considerable. Now this Lagrange point, Lagrange number two, um, is a place where there, there is this neutral gravity and the spacecraft does a sort of loop the loop. It's not completely secure in that position. It should stay there, but um, the sun's energy, its light can actually put pressure on the, on the spacecraft. Uh, it, it doesn't sit there perfectly. The moon has an effect. Other planets can have an effect. The solar wind can have an effect on its position. So they, they do have to give it a little shivel and a shovel every now and then just to make sure it stays uh, on course, as it were. But it's going to operate in that position for 10 years, away from the light of the Earth, away from radio interference and everything else. And 1.5 million kilometers, so it's further away than the moon, 384,000 kilometers. This is 1.5 million. And by being that far away from the Earth, it's going to be in the black, black, blackness of space. Now, the purpose of the telescope not only is to be away from the Earth, but also by doing that, it can peer for extended periods of time into the vastness of the universe. Now, scientists have plenty of answers. They all have answers. But of course, as the instruments become more refined and more capable, sometimes they raise questions to which we as yet don't have those answers. And that's where the James Webb Space Telescope will come into its own. Yes, the answers we have at the moment are, are dare I say it, clumsy to some extent. But of course, by refining it with these wonderful pieces of instrumentation, there are actually four very sophisticated instruments on board the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, and each one will pick away at the detail. And yes, it will raise an awful lot more questions. But by looking deep into space, we can look back in time. Uh, some people find this a little bit of a difficult concept, but when we look at the moon, and there is a beautiful moon, nearly full this evening, in fact, so depending on which part of the Earth you're on, have a look at the moon this evening. It's quite low down now towards the uh, horizon, uh, but it's nearly full. When you look at the light of the moon with your eyes, it's actually taken 1.2 seconds to get from the moon to your eyes. That means the moon to you is about 1.2 or one and a quarter seconds younger as we see it than it actually is because the light's taken that time to get to us. If we were looking at say Jupiter, that's around about an hour younger because the light takes about an hour to get from Jupiter uh, to here through our telescopes or even binoculars, dare I say, uh, to our eyes. So with the James Webb Space Telescope and its capabilities of that giant mirror, it can actually look back in time, considerably back in time, to the very, almost the very, very edge of where the universe became transparent, where the universe had cooled sufficiently for photons, i.e. particles of light, to move around freely. And that means we can go right the way back, pretty much, to the, how the universe first started, how the very, very first stars formed. And we can understand more about those early stars. I mean, when we look at things, let's take gold, for example. I've, I have a, a ring here on my finger, which is gold. Gold, element number 79, where did that come from? It came from stars. And the very first stars had to do their job really well. Dmitry Mendeleev in 1859 created the very first periodic table where all those elements, hydrogen and helium and all those wonderful elements were listed. And he realized they had a certain atomic number and he could list them in order. And probably some of you will know that element number six is carbon. And then we get to element number eight, which is oxygen. And without oxygen and carbon and hydrogen, we're not, we're not building the sugars and the bases of DNA. We're not building life. So in a way, the James Webb Space Telescope is all about life. How did it get here? Is this just an accident that we're here? Or is there life everywhere? And then if there is life e everywhere, then how many times does that life actually turn into sentient beings, standing upright, scratching their heads and puzzling over what the universe 
is all about because that effectively is where we need to know those answers we, we're fundamentally where we're climbing mount everest for the first time but it's in the universe that's what we're doing here the james webb space telescope is going to unlock innumerable things that we have as yet not even begun to explore i think the scientists are going to be shocked i think they're going to be very shocked as to how capable this piece of equipment actually is now you might be asking, why doesn't it look like a telescope? Well, that's because it's in space. It, it doesn't need to contend with gravity. Gravity on the Earth pulls things downwards towards the surface, and the very large telescopes at the tops of mountains are built to hopefully hold their various instruments in the right place as the telescope swings through parts of the sky to record whatever it sees. But in space, there isn't the same way to manage gravity it, it's it's weightless but you still have to configure it to fight against other things like the big shield you can see in the animation there which you can actually access through the nasa uh, james w uh, james webb space telescope uh, site and you can see this is a this is a live animation of what where the james webb Sp space telescope is compared to the planets and the earth and everything else but of course that sun shield uh, there, make sure that the, the, the space telescope isn't going to be blinded by anything that shouldn't be there, and also mainly from the sun, because the sun is really still bright, although it's 1.5 million kilometers away, it's still effectively as close to the sun as we are, that's, that's no difference at all. Um, so this instrument is, is big, it's certainly the biggest. Um, they had to fold up the mirror because otherwise they would not have been able to pack everything away and then house it in the fairing at the top of the rocket, the Ariane rocket, which is a very capable rocket in the first place. Today, however, we are waiting for Elon Musk's beautiful Starship, which has a nine meter diameter all the way from the bottom to the top. So this is a very, very sort of stick like rocket, extremely tall, 130 meters tall. Um, and we possibly could see larger mirrors and not folded up necessarily, tucked away in the fairing uh, at the top of these rockets. Um, but it may be the case, yes, we, we put larger uh, telescopes with still folding mirrors, but even larger than that, there's one called Voir, uh, which is going to be a huge telescope, uh, much, much bigger than even the James Webb Space Telescope. And of course, the bigger the telescope, the bigger the collecting surface area, the fainter objects you'll see, the further back in time you will go, right back to the very, very beginning. Will we see those first stars? Will we be able to record things about the early universe? I really do hope so. But then, of course, we've got things nearer to us, such as exoplanets, planets which have been discovered to orbit stars. And we can pick away at the atmospheres of these planets. We can see what they're made of. Maybe the pollutants caused by the civilizations that just might be living on these planets. Invariably, exoplanetary systems do not mimic the solar system. And it may be, from our understanding of many of these exoplanetary systems, uh, that our solar system is a little bit different to nearly all the other systems where our large planets sit further from the central star and the smaller planets huddle up close to their central star. Why is the Earth the way the Earth is? And when we look at these exoplanets, usually they don't seem that way. We've got one which I believe is going to be revealed tomorrow uh, and it, it, it orbits around its star in just a couple of days, I think three, three and a half days or something. And it's really close to its parent star. Is it, is it sun synchronous? In other words, does it keep one face pointing towards its central star? And it would be rather bizarre, one side completely in darkness all the time, a bit like our moon, which orbits the Earth. We only ever see one face because that is Earth synchronous. It keeps its face pointing towards the Earth at all times. The far side of the moon, we can never see without the aid of spacecraft. So picking away at the details of exoplanets, seeing whether there is that possibility of life, we confuse sometimes, I think, the difference between habitable and inhabited. We have not yet found any evidence whatsoever of alien life, but maybe, just maybe, 
the James Webb Space Telescope might change that. And we might get some strange answers to some of those questions as well. There are dangerous stars. And there's one particular star, which is possibly going to be revealed tomorrow, Eta Carinae. Now that's a constellation in the Southern Hemisphere. So if you're from Australia or New Zealand, you can, you can glimpse it. And Eta Carinae is a star that's very massive. It's a very, very much more massive star than our sun. And we know that it's getting closer and closer to the end game. In other words, this star being so massive really will pop its clogs and it really will go bang creating the gold and the platinum and the silver and all those other heavier elements that we see in the periodic table. So the James Webb Space Telescope hasn't just got one job to do, it has many, many jobs to do, uh, hopefully uh, in the future, and we'll find new games for it to play. There's no doubt about that at all. Um, I'm going to just quickly introduce you to um, uh, uh, Steve Young, who uh, runs uh, Astronomy Now and also Spaceflight Now. You can pick up both those websites, astronomynow.com and also um, spaceflightnow.com. And you can find out uh, all about space, not only astronomy, but also um, astronautics, which is all about rockets and humans going into space as well. So I don't know whether Steve, do you want to just cheer up in for a moment? Hello, Greg. Hi. I'm uh, pushing all the buttons in the background, but unfortunately I can't seem to get the White House to move this. We're still waiting on them. Yes, so Joe Biden is just hanging about a little bit in the background. <laughs> I think the scientists will be just going, please, please get him, get him on show. Yeah, it's gonna be very, very exciting. There was a, um, um, a photograph revealed about five days ago which was taken by the fine guidance uh, instrument uh, on the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, it's, it's not fully calibrated for the type of imagery that we are going to see uh, with the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, for example, the stars had black centers because you need to very, very slightly change the position of the telescope. And that's basically the job of the fine guidance instrument. But the detail that it did uh, reveal, I think several people went, hang on a minute, what we're seeing here is the deepest infrared image of the universe. And by the way, if you ever see any orange colored photographs, they've been colorized because we as humans cannot see infrared. You probably knew that, but they should be black and white, surely. But they're not, they're orange though. So to give you a sense that they're sort of orangey red, they're in the infrared. But the, of course, color images are possible but they will be synthesized because the James Webb Space Telescope is an infrared telescope, which means it sees the longer wavelengths of light. In a way, that's a good thing. Long wavelengths of light can punch through dust. The reason why sunsets are red is because only the longer wavelengths, after having every bit of light wavelength scattered, the blue scatters in the daytime in our atmosphere, but the red punches through the dust towards the horizon, because in that direction, when we're looking towards the horizon, we're looking through about 400 kilometers of our atmosphere. But when we look straight up, we're only looking through, I don't know, 20, maybe 40 kilometers of air, and it's, you know, right amount of dust as well. So it's less dust. So the James Webb Space Telescope, with its far larger um, mirror, will be able to look maybe towards the center of our own galaxy, and start seeing things there that as yet we haven't seen. I know many of you saw the wonderful uh, image captured by the Event Horizon Telescope of the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy, 4.2 million times the mass of our sun and controlling the stars very close to the event horizon itself and getting some of those stars to move at unbelievable speeds, several thousand kilometers per second. That's how fast they're moving. So they're moving quite a fraction of the speed of light. And of course, the original event horizon image was taken of M87, a, a lovely galaxy. Um, and M87 is a spiral galaxy similar to ours, but considerably larger. And uh, it took the image and that particular black hole had a mass of around about seven 
billion times the mass of our sun, so considerably larger. But nevertheless, supermassive black holes are the, the end game of the collisions that galaxies undergo. And we are certainly going to undergo a collision in about four billion years when the Andromeda galaxy, closing the space between us and it, by around about 100 kilometers a second. So in about 4 billion years, uh, the two galaxies are going to rip each other to pieces. Um, but of course, in about 4 billion years, the Earth won't be here, Venus won't be here, Mercury won't be here. In fact, the Sun will have died and turned into a white dwarf, so a small little remnant of its former self. So we're going to be able to build a much, much better picture of our universe with this James Webb Space Telescope. Anybody who wants to get into space right now, and maybe you're thinking about going to university, there will be so many things you could do with the data sets that are coming in. Now, there is a website called Uni um, Zooniverse, zooniverse.org. And if you want to sign into that, some of you may want to try your hand at being scientists, because this is a very advanced website. You can do uh, crater counting, which doesn't sound very exciting, but I promise when you get into any of these subjects, they do naturally become much, much more exciting. Now, as for our night sky at the moment, just to change the subject a little bit, uh, we do have an almost full moon. Unfortunately, um, uh, we have the Perseid meteor shower and that uh, occurs on the 12th and 13th, so tomorrow and, and the day after. But with this full moon around, it's going to be very difficult to see the meteors, at least the faint ones. But if you want to stay up fairly late, um, you will see them from the minute it starts to get dark. Get, get comfortable in a chair or lie down on your, on, on if, if you have a grassy space. Lie down and just take it easy. Just relax and you will see the little pieces of debris that the earth bumps into. People think they, they, they bump into the earth, but it's actually the other way around because the earth is in orbit around the sun and it moves at 107,000 kilometers per hour. So these grains of dust that have been left behind by comets, because as comets get closer to the sun, although they are black and dark, they contain ice and the ice gets exposed to the sun. It starts to sublimate. Uh, boil, that's it, yeah, boil. They boil off and they scatter dust uh, in the form of tails. And uh, those uh, dusty tails are intercepted by the Earth. And that's why we see these meteor showers. So if you want to see the meteor showers, that's that's for tomorrow night and the night after. It actually lasts about a week or so. So don't be too upset if you if you don't see any. But with the full moon, it's going to limit how many you will actually see. But also we have Saturn, of course, and that's soon to come to opposition, which means it's directly opposite the sun in space. So from the Earth's point of view, the sun will be behind us and Saturn will be in front of us. That means it'll be fully illuminated, set against a really dark sky. At the moment, it's in Capricornus, the lovely constellation of Capricornus, my birth sign, in fact, uh, moving towards Aquarius. And um, it's fairly low down near the horizon. It's not ridiculously low. It is beginning to climb. Um, it takes about 30 years to orbit the sun. So if you wait 15 years, it'll be nice and high up in sort of Gemini and Aries. That'll be quite nice to see then. Really high up, actually. Um, but at the moment, it's a bit low down. But the rings are still very well presented. And if you have a small telescope, you should be able to pick out its largest moon, Titan, which of course is one of the very few moons in our solar system with an atmosphere. In fact, it's the only one with a very substantial atmosphere, about one and a half times as dense as the Earth's atmosphere and made of nitrogen, which is the very gas that you're breathing right now. Yes, there is some oxygen in the air you're breathing, but it's mainly nitrogen is what you're breathing. Uh, but if you want to wait till the uh, sort of get up early, you'll see a sort of a line of planets. They were heralded um, about a week ago on the news saying there's a big line of planets. They, they do that every now and then. It's just the way they, they orbit the sun. But uh, you'll get Jupiter, Mars, uh, Venus. Uh, you'll see those uh, really before the sun rises. So if you want to if you want to get up nice and early, that's a good one. But it will have to be fairly early because we're in the summer months in the northern hemisphere. So mm, pretty early for that. OK, so that's that's the night sky. Um, and I, for Greg, some of you, you you're doing yes. a great job as a warm up man to President Biden. Uh, Oh, OK. Has he come on yet? We're still waiting. Um, I'm still, I, still waiting. I believe, I believe he's going to uh, unveil a, an image 
that's a deep field image that will rival the Hubble image. Oh, do you wow. um, do do you know like anything about the the deep field image that we might see tonight? Well, only that it was taken by if it, if it is the one I'm thinking about, it was the one that was taken by the fine guidance system. I have a feeling it, it's not that one. I think it's it's going to be another one, but it may be that one. And they may be talking about how amazing it is that although originally it was released as just an image by the fine guidance system, it was very quickly realized that the depth of this was ridiculous, that it was looking back way beyond the Hubble, what the Hubble was capable of. And this is an instrument in a way uh, built by the Canadians to, to sort of guide the telescope and keep it on track. Um, what it can do, it's quite amazing, actually. It can it can find a star within the field, lock onto that star. And then they can sort of rotate the telescope so it keeps that star in the field of view. Don't ask me how this all works. The scientists have got it, the engineers rather, have got it really well sorted out. It's a brilliant piece of instrumentation. Of course, don't forget, uh, the UK provided an instrument and that was the MIRI, the Mid-Infrared Instrument. And um, they're, they're all infrared instruments, pretty much. Um, some of them have spectrographic things. So in other words, they can look at the various wavelengths. I, I, I think I need to, to point something out about the James Webb Space Telescope because it is an infrared telescope and there's a reason why it's an infrared telescope. It's because it wants to see the early universe and what tends to happen, which is Edwin Hubble, Edwin Hubble, when he did his surveys using the 48 inch telescope uh, on, uh, in, in America, uh, it was a Schmidt telescope, had a very wide field, and he, he did a survey of galaxies and realized that most galaxies were red shifted. In other words, specific um, wavelengths of starlight had been shifted slightly longer. And in fact, the fainter, the generally the fainter the galaxy, uh, the, the more red shifted it was, and therefore gave Edwin Hubble the very great impression that the universe was expanding. And that's where we get the Hubble constant from. So we know the universe is expanding. Now we can only look back to the time when the universe became transparent. That's about 360,000 years after the Big Bang. And that's the image that many of you might have seen. It's the multicolored strange image of the micro, cosmic microwave background radiation, first sense by Penzias and Wilson using one of the very first radio telescopes. Doesn't really, didn't really look like a radio telescope, but uh, it was. And um, they, they, they had problems calibrating it to, to do its job. And one of the reasons why they had a problem calibrating it is because the, the, the slight amount of energy they were receiving wasn't from uh, bird poo that they thought was in the, in the horn of this, of this uh, radio telescope um, and they actually cleared out the pigeons and all the birds and their and their guano um, and it still registered this annoying amount of energy and it turns out this equates to about three degrees kelvin now when you go back to the big bang that was around about i think i'm right in saying this about 10 to the power of 42 degrees kelvin in other words quite hot and what the universe has done is expand. You don't lose energy. So what's happened is that either the energy has been converted into uh, baryonic matter, such as gas and dust and you and me, uh, or it stays as energy, but spread out. And of course, all that energy is now spread out in this much, much larger universe. Now, the universe is expanding way faster than the speed of light. And, and people say, but you can't. Because things that Einstein said you can't go faster than the speed of light. It's true, you can't inside the universe. Nothing inside the universe can go faster than the speed of light. That is, that's a fact, that's true. But the universe itself can expand faster itself. The whole thing can. And there's another weirdness about the universe. It's not expanding into anything. This is, this is the crazy bit. It, it makes, the, there's a lovely scene in Wallace and Gromit, that lovely cartoon. And um, he's in the kitchen. The little dog is on a train rushing across the kitchen. He's actually laying down the track in front of the train. And that's pretty much what the universe is doing. It lays down the space into which everything's expanding. And then you say, wait a minute, if everything's expanding, the galaxies are expanding. No, they're overwhelmed by their own gravitation. So gravity localized 
is stronger than the overall expansion of the universe. And now, by studying dying stars, such as supernovae, particular types of su supernovae, we can map the increased expansion, the acceleration to the expansion of the universe, and that is now called dark energy. But of course, there's the other, other energy that suggests that galaxies should fall apart. And we think that the stuff that's controlling, preventing galaxies from falling apart is actually dark matter. And that's about nearly 30% of the universe and the rest of it is all dark energy. So the only bit we can perceive, sense, taste, whatever, is around about 5%. 5% is everything we can possibly do with the universe. It's a tiny amount, and yet we're managing to learn an awful lot about the universe. We have to thank people like uh, Fritz Zwicky, Swiss scientist, um, brilliant man, very, very clever man. Um, and Vera Rubin, of course, uh, studied the spectra of galaxies to see how they turned, how they rotated. And she could tell from the, the, the leading edge compared to the trailing edge of the galaxy, how the redshift in those stars within the galaxy led to her understanding how fast those galaxies were, were rotating. And she also came to the conclusion that they can't spin that fast. It's ridiculous. The stars should f fly away and they're just not flying away into space. They, they hold station, just like the Milky Way, the galaxy in which we find the Earth and the Sun and all those lovely planets as well. Rick, are we sources at the White House are saying they're getting very close. So hopefully oh, we'll be able to go there and we'll switch over as soon as we can. OK. Uh, I'm going to apologize to everybody about my ruddy face. It's for two reasons. One is uh, I'm actually very, very hot. We've had uh, very hot temperatures, as most people in the UK are, are aware of. Uh, today, it reached just 32 degrees. OK, wow. Uh, it's been hovering around about 29, 30, 30. And I think it reached 32 degrees here. But also, I, I was in the sun for too long and um, uh, at the weekend. So uh, you have to forgive me. So I'm looking a little bit red in the face. So our, our sun is not such a good bedfellow when we when we're talking about um, infrared light. It's, it's I think powerful. you've been red shifted. I have been red shifted. Indeed, you're absolutely right. Just to remind everybody, Steve is in the background. He's the one pressing all the buttons. And hopefully, uh, we will go over to the White House and uh, get Joe Biden's um, sort of uh, way he's looking at things and hopefully he'll he'll speak momentarily and reveal this wonderful image are we re unveiling it or are we revealing it i'm never quite sure but it is the first image because tomorrow tomorrow the images are going to be released and there's there's a whole handful of them that are going to be released and they've been collecting these i mean one has taken i think was 72 images i think and it was 36 hours to, to collect which is which isn't that long but long enough and there'll be many more longer exposures, I'm sure, to, to really get back in time and look right back to the baby, baby universe. And of course, the universe did expand extremely quickly. It uh, went through this sort of very strange quantum uh, changes and then expanded. It wasn't really an explosion. It sort of just expanded. And um, the very first time we could sense the universe existed, as we do today, is that microwave background radiation, which was lumpy and bumpy. So... We, I, I, I tend to use a phrase which I hope is quite useful. Um, there's the same difference everywhere in the universe. I mean, many of you may have done school trips where you've gone to a field, you've taken your one meter square, a piece of wood, and you laid it on the grass, you count the blades of grass, you make a little note, everybody's got a clipboard, and you count the number of bugs, and the, you, just, you just count. And then you stand up. And you look at the field and you go, yep, that's pretty much how it is over there and over there. And that's, that's what scientists do. They take a little section of the sky and they, 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 they count. I mean, when the, James, when the Hubble Space Telescope did its really long, ultra deep field, I mean, that was a huge length of time. And they had to integrate each image together to take those very faint and few and far between photons and stitch them together into a single image and it, it revealed really really deep parts of our universe uh, well if, if we do the same thing with the james webb space telescope goodness knows what what it is going to reveal and i'm sorry to go on about the depth of things but that is going to be really really exciting 
uh, I, I, um, I, I sometimes get, uh, you, children are really good at asking difficult questions. Adults tend to be more reserved. Um, but uh, the, the question that does come up quite, uh, quite often is, um, how big is the universe? You know, how big is it? it? Is it a certain size? We think it's around about 96 billion, 96 billion light years in diameter. But of course, that's not the universe we can see because light started its journey when the universe was smaller. And that universe, the light from that edge is 13.8 billion light years in radius. So it's as if we are in the center. Of course, we're not in the center of the known universe. It just seems that way. And that light has taken 13 point. We can't see further than that because the light the universe has expanded it's gone out much further than that so either the universe is 96 billion light years in diameter or, or it goes on forever or it goes on forever uh, crazy stuff we're, we we're just humans we don't have brains big enough uh, to deal with that type of strangeness because we can't i mean you can try an exercise if you wanted to prove it um, can you think of 10 things now, can you think of a hundred things? Can you actually comfortably think of a hundred things? I think when you're in a crowd, like at a tennis match or a football match, you probably can visualize that. But when you get to say a million things, we can't do that. Humans just can't. So big numbers, we can say the numbers, but we don't actually understand what that actually means. It's a, it's a difficult one. We, we're just human beings. And I can I can fully understand how some people in society imagine that the earth is flat, because when you stand up and look around, it looks flat. But it isn't, I'm afraid. We are just so, so tiny compared to the diameter of or circumference, in fact, of, of our earth. And it was people like Aristophanes who, who calculated the circumference of the earth. He got to within about one percent, just seeing how. A well on a certain day of the year, one day in a year, there was no shadow cast at the bottom of the well. You could actually get the sunlight going right down to the bottom. But 800 kilometers north, an obelisk in uh, Syene, I think it was, uh, did cast a shadow on the same day. And he realized they must be fixed to the surface of a giant globe. At the very first time. Of course, the idea is that the Earth was uh, more like a globe uh, was way before then as well. And then, of course, we come forward to Kepler, who gave us the basic outline of gravity in a way, because he realized there were several ways of understanding how planets moved. And then, of course, we get to Isaac Newton, whose fabulous book, Naturalis Principia Mathematica, was actually paid for by the second astronomer royal. You've all heard of him. It's Edmund Halley. And of course, he was the man who predicted the return of the comet named after him. He waited because he knew it would return and he waited and he died about three years before it actually did return. So I think it's the only comet named by somebody who never actually saw the comet. <laughs> never mind. Things like that turn out in science. Yeah. Any closer, Steve? I'm sure our audience. Well, don't want to I keep hear hearing. I keep hearing it's within five minutes, but it's been within five minutes for a while. OK, do we have any means of answering questions in this feed or not, Steve? We certainly do. Uh, so if people want to uh, uh, sort of uh, put your questions on the uh, in the chat, I'm sure we can fire a few of those and try and answer a few of them. Steve, are there any questions already up there? We did have someone ask earlier about the solar wind and whether it affects the uh, Webb Space Telescope. Well, there was a, a bit of a shock um, the other day. It isn't to do with the solar wind, and I will come back to that. Uh, but of course, what's in space is dust. Some of the dust is quite big. Most of it is about the size of a, a grain of salt in your salt cellar in your kitchen at home. Uh, but a few are about the size of a pea, and they they can be moving pretty fast because most of them are in orbit around the sun. And if you think that the Earth is moving at 107,000 kilometers an hour, it doesn't matter about how much mass you have. In order to stay in that orbit, you 
you have to be at 107,000 kilometers an hour. The reason why the International Space Station orbits the Earth at 27,600 kilometers an hour is because it's 400 kilometers up. If it was further up, it would be traveling more slowly, like the moon, for example, which is much further away, and that only moves at about one kilometer, just a fraction over one kilometer per second, so a lot slower. Well, pieces of debris in space are moving according to their distance, really, from the sun. So they're anywhere between around about 20 to 60 kilometers a second, so pretty fast. And one of the composite mirrors on the James Webb Space Telescope was hit by a particle which was probably at the absolute upper limit of what engineers had expected might happen. And they did quite a lot of work in trying to work out the flux, in other words, the rate at which the James Webb uh, telescope mirrors would be uh, hit by pieces of dust. And they try to scale up where it is in space, what the likely sizes of these particles are. And in fact, this was right at the upper limit of what they had expected. And it really was within a, just a few months of unfurling the mirror. So yeah, the, the James Webb Space Telescope is fully exposed to whatever is out there. Now, going back to the solar wind, that great big sun shield can actually get affected by light from the sun. It can also be affected by the solar wind. And in fact, there are attitudes. In other words, the James Webb Space Telescope has to be tilted and pointed in different directions, but there are safety zones built into its navigation system. So it can never point uh, at the moon. It can never point at the sun. It can never point at things that are bright. Uh, but otherwise it would damage the instruments because they're incredibly, incredibly sensitive. They need to be. They're looking at the blackness of space in a way. Uh, so yeah, these, um, the, 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 the James Webb Space Telescope is affected by various bits of space uh, and we, we, they have to control it, give it little thrusters that make sure it stays on station all the time. Any other questions, Steve, that are coming forward? People want to know your name. Oh, my name is Greg Smy Rumsby, and you'll see me, or rather you'll see my name appear every now and then against many of the images in um, the Astronomy Now magazine. I also uh, work at the Royal Observatory uh, in Greenwich, and I do planetarium shows and workshops and lots of things. That's why I mentioned the children, because we, we, we teach uh, Key Stage 2 and Key Stage 3 and 4 and 5. So, yeah, quite a few Key Stages. Um, I, I, I thoroughly enjoy it. I've been there almost 20 years. I can't believe it. it. It's nearly 20 years I've been there. And I think I've been working close to 20 years for Astronomy Now magazine as well, because I think I joined you in 2003, 2004, something like that. So, yeah. Sounds it's about funny. right. Sounds about An right. Another I, question. I didn't have grey hair then. I didn't have grey hair. <laughs> None of us did. Another question. <laughs> uh, somebody wants to know if uh, JWST might find alien life. Okay, so this is a, a difficult one. Um, I was asked to run a course uh, at the Royal Observatory, which is coming back in October, and it's uh, all about alien life, uh, the possibilities, etc. I think that there are there are lots of issues with suggesting alien life is out there. Um, if we go back to 1950, uh, we had Enrico Fermi, uh, famous scientist at the time, suggesting where are the aliens? Because by now. Uh, we had the technologies uh, around, uh, some of the large telescopes. Uh, we should have been able to detect something about alien life. They had radio telescopes then, 1950. Uh, yeah, it, we, should have, we should have seen something and, and nothing, nothing was forthcoming. Uh, alien life is, is a difficult one. And I think most people, when you say alien life, are talking about sentient beings. Now, we know the universe is a machine for creating um, the chemistry of life because it's, you can see it written in the periodic table. You've got hydrogen right at the top. In the next row down, you've got really got the three protagonists of life, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. Now, they're sitting there, and, and you can build sugars, fats, starches, the bases of DNA, all at the very top of the periodic table. Now, if you look at the periodic table differently, if you look at abundances, you'll find that carbon and hydrogen are pretty much the same quantities in the environment of the universe. So when we look at stars, 
we think oh yes they've died they've gone through their life cycle they were made out of hydrogen they started to produce helium as a new fuel and once they reached the threshold where uh, the nuclear furnace would switch over to this new fuel, helium, and then the, it would switch over again because gravity, it's gravity that makes stars shine. You could make stars of anything, you could make them of squirrels if you want to, you'd need a lot of squirrels. But eventually, gravity squeezes so hard that the, 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 the central core begins to start producing light or, or at least energy. And uh, it's thermonuclear process or um, nucleosynthesis and in the case of our sun it's it's just building the nuclei of, of helium but eventually that will become a fuel source even for our sun but it's our sun's too small it's it's not very massive so it's never going to go bang it's just going to mumble around until eventually it dies but the big stars they do create those heavier elements and there they are right at the top of the the periodic table now all those other elements the trace elements in our body are also necessary zinc and magnesium they're they're in there as well so so we do an iron iron the element that actually kills off giant stars element element number 26 and by the time stars are producing iron uh, they, they stop because iron is so ridiculously stable that it, it doesn't yield any energy so the the the, the gravity then wins Gravity then crushes the star, and that's why we get what we call stellar black holes. Don't confuse them with supermassive black holes. We end up with stellar black holes. And uh, there's lots of stellar black holes out there. I think um, the one in Cygnus is about 6,000 light years away. Uh, so yeah, there are, there are black holes out there. And there's even now talk of these tiny black holes, which I think are uh, theoretically feasible. But anyway, I, I, I can't go into that because my knowledge is very, very limited indeed when it comes to black holes, at least. Um, so alien life, mm. I think the universe is a machine for making life, and I think we shouldn't confuse habitable with inhabited. However, if the planets are around stars which aren't too bursty, in other words, they don't cough and splatter, they're like our sun, they just produce an even amount of energy, they don't suddenly spark, you know, x-rays and gamma rays and all sorts of radiation, if they're calm and they just do that job. And being a fairly small star, you know, not too massive, our sun's gonna live a long while. So dinosaurs came along, they didn't pay attention. They got wiped out by an impactor, you know, in the Yucatan Peninsula, 66 million years ago, bye-bye dinosaurs. But we have technology, we, we can deal with um, in, in inbound things. And in fact, in October and November time, we've got DART, the double asteroid redirect test, which is going to go to a little asteroid uh, called Didymus. And it has a, a tiny little moon called uh, Dimorphos. And it's going to push this moon. And scientists will look at the data and see by how much it's pushed, this, pushed the moon so we can build future technologies to protect us from an inbound asteroid. Well, the dinosaurs, they came, they went, and then we're here. So are there worlds where there's life? I think the answer to that is absolutely. It's too commonplace. Carbon, very abundant. Uh, oxygen, very abundant. Carbon-based life form should be out there, but it will be a smelly slime, single cell. So where do we go from the single cell to the multiple cell status where we are? Probably or possibly a fluke, a fluke. Imagine you're holding in your hand, I don't know, 10,000 dice and you throw them onto a tabletop, they all have to throw a six. What's the chance? Negligible. But that is pretty much what happened once life got started on the earth, because a single cell was invaded by another cell. And the mitochondria cell inside your cells, each, and, and all living creatures, including plants, um, is a separate cell, but it wasn't destroyed or engulfed by the primary cell. So something weird went on there. And really, I suppose, in a way, it kickstarted evolution. But without it, you're just smelly slime. And then suddenly you've got multi-cell creatures, and then we, it gets more complicated. And then the weird thing happened. Oxygen started to be freed from the chemistry of the air, because 
Doctor Who in his TARDIS, going back to the very first vestiges of life, would step out of the TARDIS and drop dead because there isn't any oxygen for him to breathe. In fact, it's just poisonous gases, uh, sulfur dioxide, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide. There's, there's no free oxygen. There's oxygen in there. You can hear it in the words, carbon dioxide. You can hear it. But free oxygen, no, that had to be released from life forms. But then it built up too much and the life forms couldn't tolerate it. Nearly every life form died soon after they started producing great quantities of oxygen. So it was almost counter reactive. But then something even more magical happened. Those early life forms started to tolerate the oxygen. And that's where we come in, because today's um, animated life forms, you know, the, the mammals and the fishes and all the rest of it, they can tolerate oxygen and it allows them to become, well, where we are today. And uh, yeah, it's it, life in the universe is, is a difficult question. There's another problem. We, there are, there's a thing called the Goldilocks zone. You've probably heard of it. So let me just very quickly explain. If you have a star and you have a planet and it's a certain distance from that star, if it ha if it has water on its surface and it's in the Goldilocks zone of that star, then that water will be liquid. That's the key thing. That's called the Goldilocks zone or the habitable zone. But there are actually three habitable zones. So the first one is the one I've just spoken about. The second one is the habitable zone in spiral galaxies. Now, spiral galaxies tend to be smaller than the big elliptical galaxies, which contain many more stars and they are considerably, usually considerably more massive. But in spiral galaxies, there is a zone around the nucleus. It's about two thirds the way out to the very edge of those spiral galaxies. And that is also a habitable zone. It's a zone where stars contain sufficient heavier elements to create planets but not sufficiently heavy enough uh, to, to cause problems uh, with, with that life because of radiation or the rest of it. And then there's the third habitable zone, which is all about time. And this is where often as not, it's, it's not covered correctly by, dare I say it, uh, the, 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 the scientific um, des describers, you know, the people who are describing some of the science. This, this third one is where life can exist in the timeline of the universe. So when the universe first started, um, th there were no stars. It was the dark ages. And I think we're just about to go over to the White House and Joe Biden. So I'm going to shut up and let NASA and uh, James Webb and the White House do the talking. Over to you. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. President, Madam Vice President, everyone, thank you for joining us. This is an historic occasion. We are here to view the highest resolution image the in of the infrared universe anyone has ever seen, captured by the most powerful telescope anyone has ever made. I am proud to turn things over to a president and a vice president who have charged the entire Biden-Harris administration with leading with the science and who believe deeply in the power and possibilities of science and technology for all of us. Madam Vice President, we are particularly, uh, we particularly appreciate your leadership of the National Space Council and your commitment to ensuring uh, innovation uh, in space. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. I am very honored to be with you all. President Joe Biden and I talk often about our mutual passion for everything you all do. This is a very exciting moment to join you for the unveiling of, of the work that you have been laboring on for, for decades. Um, so to our President Joe Biden, thank you for your leadership around all of these issues. Our NASA Administrator Bill Nelson and the Office of Science and Technology Policy Acting Director Dr. Alondra Nelson. Thank you also to our colleagues from across the White House and NASA and everyone else joining us from home. 
So yes, as chair of the National Space Council, I know that today represents an exciting new chapter in the exploration of our universe. From the beginning of history, humans have looked up to the night sky with wonder. And thanks to dedicated people who have been working for decades in engineering and on scientific marbles, we can look to the sky with new understanding. When NASA launched the Hubble Space Telescope in 1990, we were able to see the stars unobstructed by the Earth's atmosphere and understand the universe in ways we could have never imagined even a few decades earlier. And now we enter a new phase of scientific discovery, building on the legacy of Hubble, the James Webb Space Telescope allows us to see deeper into space than ever before and in stunning clarity. It will enhance what we know about the origins of our universe, our solar system, and possibly life itself. This was made possible by partnership among nations. And it is an example of how the scientific endeavor can build upon the international rules and norms that govern our cooperation in space. This telescope is one of humanity's great engineering achievements. And the images we will see today are a testament to the amazing work done by the thousands of workers across our nation who dedicated years to this project. They embarked on this complex endeavor for the benefit of humankind and in the process accelerated American innovation strengthened partnerships with our allies, and will undoubtedly inspire generations to look to the heavens with excitement and ambition. With that, it is my great honor to introduce a leader who has always believed in the power of American innovation and international cooperation to achieve the remarkable, our president, the president of the United States, Joe Biden. Well, uh, it's great to be with you all. And uh, I was going to say good afternoon, but we're starting this meeting late because I was engaged in preparing for a trip to the Middle East. But today is a historic day. And thank you, Vice President Harris, uh, Chair of the National Space Council. And thank you, my dear friend and our outstanding NASA administrator and the guy, only guy here that's been in space, Bill Nelson. Bill, you're a good friend. Thank you very much for what you're doing. And uh, um, and Dr. Nelson, you've been doing a great job leading this Office of Science and Technology and Policy. It really is a matter. It really is amazing. Six and a half months ago, a rocket launched from Earth, carrying the world's newest, most powerful deep space telescope on a journey one million miles into the cosmos. First of all, that blows my mind, a million miles into the cosmos. Along the way, unfolding itself, deploying a mirror 21 feet wide, a for science and technology, for astronomy and space exploration, for America and all of humanity. You know, as an international collaboration, this telescope embodies how America leads the world, not by the example of our power, but the power of our example, a partnership with others. It symbolizes the relentless spirit of American ingenuity, and it shows what we can achieve, what more we can discover, not just about distant places, but about our very own planet and climate, like NASA's Earth Systems Observatory that we launched last year. That's why the federal government must invest, must invest in science and technology more than we have in the past. These images are going to remind the world that America can do big things, and they remind the American people, especially our children, that there's nothing beyond our capacity, nothing beyond our capacity. We can see possibilities no one has ever seen before. We can go places no one has ever gone before. You know, you've, you, you've heard me say over and over again, America is defined by one single word, possibilities, possibilities. I want to thank the team at NASA for once again showing that that's who we are. That's who we are as a nation, a nation of possibilities. And now let's take a look at the very first image from this miraculous telescope. Okay. 
Mass Administrator Nelson, I'm going to turn this over to you. So will you please tell us about what we're seeing? Mr. President, if you held a grain of sand on the tip of your finger at arm's length, that is the part of the universe that you're seeing, just one little speck of the universe. And what you're seeing there are galaxies. Uh, you're seeing galaxies that are shining around other galaxies whose light has been bent. And you're seeing just a small little portion of the universe. You know, 100 years ago, Mr. President, Madam Vice President, 100 years ago, we thought there was only one galaxy. Now, the number is unlimited. And in our galaxy, we have billions of stars or suns. And there are billions of galaxies with billions of stars and suns. And we're getting our first glimpse, as you said, Mr. President, we're looking back more than 13 billion years. Light travels at 186,000 miles per second. And that light that you are seeing on one of those little specks has been traveling for over 13 billion years. And by the way, we're going back further because this is just the first image. They're going back about 13 and a half billion years, and since we know the universe is 13.8 billion years old, we're going back almost to the beginning. That is the discovery that we are making with this. There's another thing that you're going to find with this telescope. It is going to be so precise, you're going to see whether or not planets, because of the chemical composition that we can determine with this telescope of their atmosphere, if those planets are habitable. And when you look at something as big as this is, we are going to be able to answer questions that we don't even know what the questions are yet. This is what's happening, and it's because of this wonderful team that's out here. Uh, part of that team led by Thomas Zerboken, it was in trouble financially five years ago. He took it over. He got Greg Robinson that you're going to meet to direct it, and the result is what you've seen. So what an incredible team, joined, by the way, with our international partners, the European Space Agency and the Canadian Space Agency. So this is an international endeavor. It's amazing. I wonder what the press like in those other places. We're going to give time for the press to leave, and then we'll continue the briefing. <laughs>
And in that image, we saw many, many galaxies, some of different colors. Be wary about the colors because that is not a full spectrum. However, it looks like a full spectrum. Nevertheless, the colors do indicate scientifically, here we have the image now on view, uh, scientifically, the colors do reveal much about those galaxies. Now, also what you can see uh, in the images are plenty of these strange lensed galaxies. They're slightly elongated and they're in an arc. And what they are showing us is that there are galaxies in the foreground, or rather there are clusters of galaxies in the foreground where their gravity is actually strong enough to bend the light from these more distant galaxies and focus it towards the Earth. So although you might have one, two, three, four, five, I'm looking at about six little arcs near the center of the image around those white images of galaxies. And those arcs, which have a slight pinky color to them, are almost certainly one galaxy. It's just that the mass of the foreground galaxies is making the image split apart. So you're revealing a few images of a single object. What gravitational lensing does though, is to magnify just like a magnifying lens. So although that galaxy uh, is distorted and slightly bent and twisted, um, the information contained in this galaxy has been gleaned from far, far more distant region of the universe. And then it looks a lot bigger and we can do a lot more work. And there will be no doubt computer, computer experts out there building I think most of the people are understanding the word algorithms, uh, build the algorithms to undistort the images. And we could probably build an amazing array of images uh, of these galaxies. But these are early galaxies. They're early. These are the before the modern day galaxies, such as the Milky Way and the Andromeda galaxy. Uh, these are early galaxies. And uh, there are so many. I, I have no time at all to analyze this image. I, it's, it's presented to me in the same way as it's presented to you. There is an image uh, on the screen right now. Uh, if you see that lovely starburst, by the way, the, 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 the spikes on the stars are caused by the hexagonal mirrors of the, of the primary mirror of the, of the uh, James Webb Space Telescope. Now, if you slide, go to that, the, the brightest star there with all the spikes. And if you go to the left, and you go a little bit more than halfway to the left and then drop down just a fraction, you'll see a very, very red object. Now that is a very, very distant galaxy. And I can only assume that red means red shifted. Once again, this is not, not a true color image. So red shifted simply means it's distant and therefore older than the more mature galaxies, I'm using the word very loosely, mature would suggest these are modern day galaxies, but I would surmise that nearly all of them are quite young. And then that red one is exceptionally young. And it'd be interesting to, to see that. So if you see any other little red dots, and I'm sure if we see the full blown image um, as, as a piece of data, and we can zoom in on the image, I, I tend to use Photoshop, uh, but there are plenty of other uh, image analysis tools out there that the, you, you are probably familiar with. Um, and you can zoom in on different parts of this image and actually see it. No doubt the scientists will actually deliver this all cut up and highlighted. Look at this bit, look at that bit. And it will tell us much about the universe. And I know that- um, Greg, every, I, don't yes. think, I, don't, I don't know if we uh, believe this is the full res version or not. There's only one version appeared on the NASA website. And uh, yeah. when you click on it, you don't get anything. So hopefully there's a higher resolution version and we'll be able to zoom in a bit on this image. Well, the, the James Webb Space Telescope can send back petabytes of data. That's what its antenna is designed to do. Um, so you're probably right, Steve. I would I would sit in the camp that you're right, uh, that, that there should be much higher resolution images than the one just there for the press to quickly print in tomorrow's newspapers. Um, yeah, it is a fascinating image, though. It doesn't look really anything like the ultra deep field that the Hubble Space Telescope took. 
There is a very interesting galaxy that I can see. If you go near the center of the image and just come up a little bit, it looks like there is a, an elliptical galaxy, fairly white, wearing, I don't know, a little hat, a little orange hat, slightly distorted. I can only imagine that is another galaxy, uh, either in the foreground or, 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 or not, as the case may be. But certainly the different shapes of galaxies, they, they all look a little weird com compared to the modern day galaxies that we can see closer to home. It's a, a very interesting picture. I think, I think if we could go very deeply in the data here, we'd be very surprised as to how much information we can see and how different it is to maybe our expectations as well. I have very limited um, information I can give anybody listening to this now. Um, several of you are probably more knowledgeable than I am uh, about this image, um, just based on what you know about maybe astrophotography as well and, and how, how images are put together. But certainly a fasc fascinating image. And we will pick away at this. And tomorrow, of course, we've got we've got about five, I think definitely five other images are coming in. Uh, one, of course, is of the exoplanetary star. And then we've got the um, uh, well, in this image as well. And, and several other called Eta Carinae, that dying star in the southern hemisphere in the Carina uh, constellation of Carina. Yes, fascinating. Steve, I don't think I have any anything more to say on this image, I'm afraid. Certainly not at this stage. Yes, and I'm struggling to find a higher resolution image. There's uh, the NASA website appears to uh, be broken in multiple places. Um, oh. There is uh, a uh, a link on the Space Telescope uh, Science Institute website, and that gives you a 403 error. So uh, maybe oh, too many dear, people are trying oh, to look at these images right now. But unfortunately, we can't get the higher resolution version. It'd be wonderful to be able to zoom into this image and yes, really it would see be. the detail. So what we're seeing is about the resolution that we can see it at, I assume. We can't even zoom in on this image. So, so this image, if it was at 100%, would not fill the entire screen. So we're already... Oh, so we're actually uh, slightly we're bigger than it should be. Okay. This image. So it's a, it's a real shame that uh, we can't see it. I mean, we can... We can definitely see that um, the gravitational lensing there, which is quite spectacular. Yeah. It is spectacular, very much so. But, uh, so I'm not okay, sure how you want second, us to proceed can, at this point, I'll Steve. See if I can find, I'll see if I can find us a high res version. Um, and uh, if we don't find one, we'll we'll wrap this up, and I'm sure it will be available online shortly, and people will be able to find it on the Astronomy Now website. Yeah. Are there any any questions out there, Steve, that people are asking maybe about this image? There is something um, slightly odd about the image. And I, uh, our viewers may may have noticed it as well. Uh, if you look um, to the center where that large elliptical galaxy is, it's not the one with the spikes. Uh, um, I'm not quite sure whether that's a star or not, uh, but the elliptical galaxy um, almost smack in the middle of the frame. And uh, if you uh, cast your eyes slightly to the upper right and slightly to the lower left, you'll see some gray patches. They're slightly gray. They, they almost look like very faint clouds. Now I have no idea what they may or may not be in radio uh, wavelengths galaxies often have these lobes that stick out on either side but not in the visible um oh you've got your mouse there now that's good um so i, I don't know whether you can point out to our viewers um those sort of slightly gray lobes uh, one to the upper right and one to the lower left but i i, I as i say i can't i can't speak because i don't know we enough have, information we about have the image the high res we have the high res image now, if you just bear with me. Ah, good. Be OK. Fine. All right. That'd be great. So our viewers, uh, if you wait there just a moment, Steve is doing his very best to give us the high res version of this image. And we might be able to walk around it a little bit better. Have a look at that little red object and have a look at some of the lens galaxies. And there's one um, sort of just below middle 
and slightly to the right, and it looks like a hamburger. It looks like a McDonald's, Angela. Um, a McDonald's bun, bun with a, uh, a beefy pate in, in the middle. <laughs> you can see where my diet comes from, but anyway, there we are. Oh my goodness me, that's our, oh, that's. So this is now the high res version. Can we zoom in on that red article on the uh, left hand side of the image? Mid middle, middle and left. It's very red indeed, yes. My goodness me, wow, that's, that is spectacular actually. Oh my Lord, that, that is really amazing. There are definitely stars in there. Wow. Just staggering. Uh, I don't know if you've had a chance to count the galaxies yet. No, no, I'm not even going to attempt to do so. I think nearly everything in that image is a galaxy. There are one or two stars, but nearly everything else is a galaxy. But that gray patchy stuff, you're, just, you're putting it in the center now, that gray patchy area i have no idea what that is loads and loads of images of galaxies or maybe a single galaxy uh, these arcs which are called um you know gravitational lensing einstein predicted it and we can see it quite clearly but never never have i seen them so well displayed there's that funny galaxy just coming in at the top of the screen now in the middle there steve uh, that i have no idea what's going on there but seriously it's just so weird. There's lots of weirdness in here. And there's a galaxy uh, to the right there. You've got three little stars to the right. No, no, to the right, Steve. If you go to the right. And it's got what appears to be a jet coming out of the top of it. I don't think they're associated. I, I, I don't think they sure are, but it does look like they're associated. A, it could be a star that's just superimposed on top, but it certainly yeah. uh, gives it's that weird. impression. And the... The galaxy itself has some kind of almost like a toadstool appearance. Yeah, well. yeah, I can see that quite clearly. It's probably something else overlapping. Yes. It's amazing what yeah. you can see in in these images when you let yeah. your imagination go wild. Can I ask what scale we've got this at? Is this 100% now? I am not entirely sure. I think okay. we are not yet. Let's see. I'm not seeing pixels. Oh, man, it's ridiculous. A ridiculous yes, image. I, I do not see pixels yet. So no. Let's go a little closer in. I think that is, is it. That strange is little tadpoles, now. Steve. Stop, 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 stop. On the left spike, just come up at the top of the screen, two little tadpoles. What on earth is going on there? No. I'm I'm completely bewildered. This is way outside my experience of deep sky images. Just there'll be lots of people talking about these right now around the world in their own time zones. For for me and for many of our uh, visitors on the website, um, it is now nearly twenty to midnight. Um, zoom in again, Steve. Just zoom in again back to the same position. And, and near the middle, but just underneath that lenticular galaxy, this orange, can you see that red, that little red blob? No, 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 right at the top of the screen. No, 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 you've, got, you've lost it. There it is, right at the top, that red, that tiny little red dot. Can you zoom in on that any further? That little tiny little red dot. So it's on, uh, on the spike of it's the star. We're now at 100%. A... We can't zoom in on it. Okay, don't worry, don't worry. Anymore, Just interesting how it's so red, so red, that little dot. Fascinating picture. Wow. I, I'm not sure I have anything else to say, Steve, to be perfectly honest. Well, it's certainly, um, certainly been... Uh... A long wait for these images, not just today, but the whole um, development of the Webb Space Telescope, which took many mm. years. But I think we can see the promise of the telescope and uh, exciting times and, and looking forward to the release of uh, more images tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm. 
So there we are. Shall we shall we close up shop? Yes, well, thank you, Greg. Thank you for uh, steering us through this and through the long delay we had waiting for the president. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll uh, wish you good night. I know it's um, yeah. getting late in the UK, so uh, thank you, uh, and uh, we'll uh, await the images tomorrow with great interest. Yeah, thanks ever so much for listening in, everybody. Thank you.